everybody. Hello, hello. I think we live. Let me just double check. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to pop on here. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to give everybody a chance to jump on here. Um, I did put comment in here, and I wonder if it's there. I'm not sure. I'll get that later. So welcome, everybody. I'm just going to check and see if I'm live. I'm going to look on the page and see if it's happening. Yep, there I am. How wonderful. Okay. So, welcome everybody um, to Mindfulness Meditation. Um, I'm just so happy to be here with you together. I'm coming to you from my home office. And I just cannot wait until we're back together again on the third floor of the library. But until then, we are together here virtually. Um, and the Friends of the Library, which I'll talk about later, has approved um, the rest of May and also June uh, for our meetings. So we'll be doing some uh, mindfulness meditation together. So today, what I thought we could do is... Um, we can mindfully sit, mindfully breathe, and mindfully move. Mindfulness, uh, um, uh, mindful movement together um, as we just practice coming back to our own selves, our true home, um, so that we can face anything with clarity and um, courage and we can feel like our capacity to be with other people is full and our capacity to be with our own selves is full um, because we're going to be talking about this book, Anger. Um, we're going to be talking about chapter six and a lot of what he talks about, the author Thich Nhat Hanh talks about being there for our anger um, and that our anger is the object of our anger is not outside of ourselves. It's actually ourselves. Um, and so we need to fortify this awesome space that we inhabit, this body, this mind. So that's why it's really super crucial and important to be able to cultivate the habit of coming back to ourselves. So um, before we get started, I would like to share a poem. Um, I'm taking a nonviolent communications class. And one big thing about the nonviolent communications style training is that we look at what actually happened. We look at the factual information and we don't add anything else on top of it. Um, so we just we just discover what it is that's happening, much like when we're sitting in mindful meditation. We're just looking at the thoughts that come by us, that go through our minds like clouds passing. They come in, we observe them, and then they float out. And that's exactly what um, the nonviolent communication style of communicating is about. It's just about communicating the factual information about um, the things that actually happened and not adding anything else on top of it. Um, and so this is um, a poem by Roger Keyes. And it is called Hokusai Says. And Hokusai, I think if you saw the image of this painting, you would recognize it immediately. It's quite an iconic image. It's um, called the Great Wave of Kara. Um, I forgot the name of the town in Japan, um, but it's the Great Wave. And it's a Japanese rock print that you see Mount food in the distance, but you see this really great wave happening. And then you see all these tiny little boats that are in the midst of this very great wave. And so um, if you Google this poem, you can hear Roger Keyes actually reading this poem himself. Um, 
but to me it really encapsulates that style of communication where we just focus on the facts and we don't add anything else like judgments or hurtful comments or our explosive expressions of anger um so enjoy Hokusai says by Roger E. Keys, S. Keys, sorry. Hokusai says, look carefully. He says, attention, notice. He says, keep looking, stay curious. He says, there is no end to seeing. He says, look forward to getting old. He, he says, changing. You just get more who you really are. He says, get stuck, accept it, repeat yourself as long as it is interesting. He says, keep doing what you love. He says, keep praying. He says, every one of us is a child. Every one of us is ancient. Every one of us has a body. He says every one of us is frightened. He says every one of us has to find a way to live with fear. He says everything is alive. Shells, buildings, people, fish, mountains, trees, wood is alive. Water is alive. Everything has its own life. Everything lives inside us. He says live with the world inside he says it doesn't matter if you draw or write books. It doesn't matter if you saw a wood fish. It doesn't matter if you sit at home and stare at the ants on your veranda. Or the shadows, the trees. And the grasses in your garden. It matters that you care. It matters that you feel. It matters that you notice. It matters that life lives through you. Contentment is life living through you. Joy is life living through you. Satisfaction and strength is living is life living through you. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Love, feel. Let life take you by the hand. Let life live through you. <sighs> so I'd like to invite you now to get into a comfortable position. We're going to start our mindfulness sit. And we'll sit for about 10 minutes. So I'd like to invite you into um, an upright posture. Um, nothing too um, uncomfortable where um, you're bowed forward or slouching back. Um, that, that balanced, um, here's your tailbone, that you're balanced completely erect and that your spine um, is completely erect and your feet are on the floor um, and your hands can be, some people like to put their hands like this and gently put their um, thumbs together, almost like you have um, a piece of paper between the two of them, like this, just as if you were to just hold that. Because um, someone once told me, I think it was one of the monks that I took a class with one time, he said that when he's holding his hands like this in his lap, and he feels his thumbs come apart during um, a meditation sit, he knows that perhaps his mind is wandering. And so that he can go ahead and bring his thumbs back together and start to be mindful again. So if that feels right to you, you can do that. Um, some people just like to lay their hands on their laps with their palms up or their palms down. Whatever feels most comfortable for you, um, and during the sit, if you feel like you have a bombardment of thoughts or even your body starts to feel pain, just be able to uh, sit with that and see if it 
come and you can observe it and it can then pass. Um, and then, you know, like we were talking about with nonviolent communications, not adding anything extra to it, just observing what's actually happened without adding anything extra to it. Um, and that very much is an act of rebellion because I think we are all very, the human race is very conditioned to adding on suffering to what actually is happening. So um, we can try to resist that urge and come back to our own selves as an act of rebellion. <laughs> So go ahead and close your eyes if that feels comfortable. You can also gaze softly to the floor and sort of blur your vision so that you're not looking at any one thing. And I'll start with a guided meditation and, and breathing together, and then we'll move into a silent meditation. So I'll invite the bell three times, and then we'll go into our guided meditation. Body, speech, and mind in perfect oneness. We send our hearts out along with the sound of the bell. May all who hear it awaken from forgetfulness and transcend all anxiety and sorrow. Breathing in, know that I am breathing in. Breathing out, I know that I am breathing out. In, out. Breathing in. I follow my in-breath from its very beginning to its very end. Breathing out, I follow my breath from its very beginning to its very end. In, out, beginning, end. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. I am the freshness of a dewdrop. Breathing out, my eyes have become flowers and I am looking with the eyes of love. In, out, flower, love. Breathing in, this is a wonderful moment. Breathing out, this is a happy moment. In, out, wonderful moment, happy moment.
So we'll move into silent meditation for the next couple of minutes until the next sound of the bell. Nowhere to go, nothing, calming your body, resting your body, healing your body, allowing thoughts to come and go. Feeling the energy of the mindfulness community practicing together empowering your practice today. Small bell for stretching and massage. Woo! Gotta stretch, right?
and we'll be doing another sit a little bit later on together. So now I'd like to um, move into mindful movement. We usually do mindful walking when we are um, in the third floor of the library. Um, we walk around the perimeter of the room. And the whole methodology behind mindful walking is to just be really mindful about how you're walking and um, feeling your steps and feeling every heel print and every uh, ball of your footprint and imprinting your happiness and not your worry or anxiety on the earth. Um, Thai or our teacher Thich Nhat Hanh likes to say that we like to walk not just for ourselves but for all the other people that maybe can't walk with us, maybe for our relatives that have passed on, or maybe people that aren't able to be with us right now, um, so that we can have that energetic connection um, with them because we're a continuation of them. We have their genes inside of us and they are here with us. Um, so I, I always like to do walking meditation when we're together. And um, in some of the sanghas that I've been sitting with, we actually do get up and walk around or go outside. And then we have, uh, you know, we, we say that we're gonna come back at a certain time. But today I thought we would just move our bodies mindfully and just see what we can notice. Um, to heighten our awareness because when we're sitting uh, mindfully, that's what we're doing. We're bringing awareness to the fact that we can be with ourselves, we can be with our thoughts, we can be with strong emotions, and we can be with body pain. And we can feel of those things. We can just wear. Um, it's um, a wonderful thing when we can just look at something and notice and acknowledge it and recognize it for what it is and not add anything extra to it. So I'd like to invite you to just um, sit how you were just sitting for mindfulness meditation. So I'm sitting, you know, a little bit forward on this office chair and my feet are flat on the ground. And I'd like you to start sensing your trunk. So um, start sensing um, the two sits bones. And so a uh, sits bones, that's what they refer to as the ischial area of the pelvis. So the pelvis has, you know, the pelvic flare here where the hips are, right? Under here, you may feel it when you're sitting on a really hard surface and it, it feels painful, like right under your trunk. That's that bone that I'm talking about. Those are your sits bones. And they make contact. Um, it's part of your pelvis. And it makes contact with the seat. Um, and of course, the buttock flesh, the, um, the glutes, the gluteals, they are overlaying that bone. So what I'd like you to bring your attention to is those sits bones. And just notice how you're sitting on your chair. Maybe you feel like you're gonna kind of go backwards or maybe you're tipped a little bit forward. Maybe you're sitting to one side or the other. And just notice that. Notice your natural rhythm and flow. So now I'd like to invite you to start moving from one sit bones to the other. We're gonna be moving to the left and to the right. Hopefully that's translating well because how I see myself is right now I'm moving the opposite. So I'm trying to give cues. So I'm gonna be moving to the left and then the right. And notice the moment where 
your sit bones kind of meet in the middle and you have both sit bones neutral and then the weight tends to just shift to the other one. And just notice and just being aware of all the muscles that are participating to make this event happen. All of the muscles in the belly, all the muscles in the back, all the muscles on the sides of your body, in the glutes. Maybe the legs are kind of having um, a synergistic approach. They're lending a hand. And just notice where that moment is where it's an exchange of weight. So my weight is over here on this side. And so when I come into the middle, oh, okay. There, I think at that point, it's even. And then it starts to shift to the other side. And we're just waking up those sit bones. We're waking up that. And how about we come to the center and we close our eyes and take a pause. Just hit the pause button, be lazy. And just feel maybe an echo somewhere in your body that these movements created. What are you feeling right now? I'm feeling increased blood flow in my feet for some reason and also throughout my hips. I feel like fizzy bubbles from soda. That's what it feels like in there. So now I'd like to invite you to, instead of moving side to side, we're gonna be moving forward and back. And we're still gonna be focusing on those sit bones. So we're just moving forward and back. And I'm feeling, where's the moment when I move from the central point of balance to moving forward on those sits bones and back. And we're just waking up these, this area in a different way. And then just take a pause in the middle, get central, centrally located here, neutral, and take a breath. And again, see what echoes you can feel in your body from the movement that was just happening. And now from that movement, I still feel like I wanna go forward and back. I can, it's a lingering of that movement. So I'm just curious, you can share in the comments what you felt if you feel guided to do that. So um, now I'd like to talk about um, the book that we are still reading. Um, we started, I think, we read like a chapter every other month. Um, so we have a few more chapters left, but today we're going to be talking about chapter six. And this chapter in particular of this book, Anger by Thich Nhat Hanh, um, was all about making our own heart sutra. And the heart sutra is a famous, um, what did he say? Uh, Um, it's a scripture that's chanted daily by many Buddhists, and it's the essence of the Buddhist teachings on wisdom. And so what Tai is saying is that we can create a heart sutra for our own selves, um, and that it's something that we can write, um, write down every day to remind ourselves of the things that we're grateful for. He says, 
says, this is very interesting. And I love his perspectives on such simple things. And um, it's wonderful to be able to just look at his perspectives. They're deceptively simple. Um, so Ty says that we must immerse ourselves in feelings of gratitude. And we don't just go to a person and say, you know, I'm grateful you're there. I, I see you and I love you and I'm grateful you're there. He says that we can take that feeling of gratitude for someone and take it as a moment of mindfulness for our own selves. Go, go into a quiet room, sit down and be with our feelings of gratitude for that person. Um, he says that this is creating a habit and creating a memory. He says to even write it down because in the moments where we have anger, he says we don't have access to gratitude. So we can take out this paper and we can look at it. Um, in chapter five, we read about a woman who had saved love letters from her husband that had um, passed. And she takes out these love letters and she reads them and it makes her love come alive for him again. And that's the same thing that he would like us to do. He recommends that when we feel gratitude for someone, we just read those papers when we are angry and we are all of a sudden transported back to those moments of gratitude and we have access to those beautiful gratitude. He says, when you read letters from the heart, you are saved by them. I love that. <laughs> Your savior comes from inside not outside. So you don't have to go to somebody else to um, feel gratitude or um, to emphasize your feelings of gratitude. You can do that for yourself. And I think that that's such a beautiful thing um, because you can just come to someone with an expanded capacity to love and you were able to do it for your own self. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. Um, chant your heart sutra every day. Um, he says that uh, the reason why um, he emphasizes this to go, you know, to maybe feel those feelings of gratitude and go into a space and feel them on our own is that we have to be alone in order to appreciate the other person's presence sometimes. We sometimes have this tendency to take the other person for granted or um, feel like we always need to have access to other people when we don't have necessarily have access to our own selves as much as we have access to other people. So he really um, uh, writes about having that space for us to be able to reflect on these moments of gratitude. Um, in another part of the book, he taught in of the chapter, he talks about leaving the shore of anger and that if we are um, on the shore of anger, we're feeling it. And he uses the metaphor of, you know, the shore of a beach or a river. Um, and we want to get to the other side. He says the other side is non-anger peace and liberation. And if we want to get to that other shore that is non-anger, peace and liberation, that the boat is mindful breathing, that we can get into the boat and the boat that will carry us to the other shore of non-anger and peacefulness and liberation is mindful breathing and sitting. So that is something that we can do to transform those feelings of anger into non-anger, peace, and liberation. I love this. He says the last um, par uh, line of that one particular section is, the Dharma is immediately effective quicker than aspirin. <laughs> and the Dharma just means teachings. 
So the teachings of leaving the shore of anger and mindful breathing and sitting being the boat so that we can go to the other shore, which is non-anger, liberation, and peace is immediately effective and it's quicker than aspirin. I, I love Thich Nhat Hanh. He's just so eloquent and hilarious too at the same time. What simple humor he has. Um, and he says that the Buddha recommends that if you're angry at someone, give them a present. Because if you're able to give them a present, somehow you just do not feel angry anymore. We always have a tendency to do, um, not always, I shouldn't speak in absolutes, but we may have the tendency when we're angry at somebody to not want to talk to them or maybe want to yell at them or engage in a way that is not very um, giving. And he says that one way to work with the anger, your anger, is to be able to give them a present. Um, and that there's just no way that you can feel angry after that. It's very hard to feel angry when you're giving someone a present. I'm going to have to try that sometime. So um, another section of this chapter talks about um, when understanding that when understanding, when you understand somebody and the reason why they said what they said or did what they did, or um, you can understand the situation that made you feel anger around you. Um, when you can understand, anger goes away by itself. Um, suffering is born from a lack of understanding. That that could really be something, another boat that can carry you to the other shore of non-anger and peacefulness and liberation. Um, then uh, he talks about venting. So he says that therapists suge suggest venting to let anger out. And that um, Tai says that that is quite temporary relief and it doesn't really work. Um, he says that there are side effects to that even, and they're very harmful and they could make you suffer more. And the reason why is because he says anger needs energy to manifest. And it takes a lot of energy to get angry. And by the time you've allowed anger to manifest, you're exhausted and you haven't fully expressed your anger. Um, and in a lot of ways, you haven't gotten to the root of your anger. Um, when you vent, you open up the energy of anger, but you don't look at the roots. That's what he's saying. Um, he also says that um, when you do venting, when, when you're talking to someone and complaining about someone or venting about a situation that made you angry, um, it helps you rehearse it helps you um, create this very strong habit energy so that if another situation that seems similar comes along or feels similar, we have already rehearsed that venting so that the conditions are present for anger to manifest once again. Um, and that we are more susceptible to behaving in the same way and allowing the anger to manifest in that way. And I thought that that was brilliant because um, it truly does shine a light on this coping mechanism that we have called venting. Um, that there was um, a New York Times article that um, was published um, in 1999 called Letting, uh, Letting Out Aggression is Called bad advice. Um, and it basically did um, say that science is backing that up, that actually venting can make anger worse. Um, and the last thing that Thich Nhat Hanh said in this chapter is that you are the um, The reason why he said that, I was very curious 
curious that headline or that um, section topic, I said, hmm, what is he going to say here? This is interesting. Um, but what he's saying is that um, we carry within us all of the um, the seeds inside of us for anger. And they're all primed. They're all seeds that could grow up and manifest into something. And in the Buddhist tradition, he, there's this concept of 51 seeds. Um, and they're, they're good. I hate to like label because it's, that's not really like a great thing to do. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, good seeds, bad seeds. But there are some seeds like anger um and worry and anxiety and happiness and joy and excitement there's lots of there's no good seeds or bad seeds i was completely wrong when i said that but i think our culture does talk about that a lot you know that we can view so present there are certain seeds that can be watered and they will come to come to pass they will manifest and genetically physiologically and scientifically um the people that we're surrounded with um not just our family but let's start with the family ty says that our family is our continuation or we are their continuation because maybe um, we have children and when we have children, they are our con continuation. But if we are children and our parents are there and we're talking with them, then I am my the continuation of my mother and my father and my grandmother and my grandfather. And continuation, what that means is it passes down um, of the generations genealogically we are all continuations of each other down the line so that like when i said that we were mindfully walking we're not just walking with ourselves but we're walking for our family we're walking for our mother we're walking for our father and we could be walking with them it's because they're with even cellularly we have their cells in our side of us so we can say that we are walking with our mothers and fathers. So what Ty is saying here is that we are continuations. We are descendants. We are um, sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers. And so we don't have to be um, angry with them. And we don't have to be angry with ourselves. And there's, there's, no, um, there's no break in there. We are each other. Um, he says, as a mother pregnant with your child, you had this insight that your child is you. You ate for your baby. You drank for your baby. You took care of your baby. When you took care of yourself, you took care of me. You were very careful because you knew that the baby was you. But by the time your child reaches the age of 13 or 14, you begin to lose this insight. You and your child feel separated, less connected. You don't know how to improve your relationship, to make peace after a fight. Soon the gap between the two of you grows bigger and more solid. Your relationship becomes very difficult and full of conflict. I no longer want to have anything to do with my father. So that he was talking about this moment when um, somebody was getting very angry and said these things that they didn't want to have anything to do with their father. But that's impossible because their father is in them. So what he's trying to say is when there is no break and you guys are connected everyone is connected that's the real truth your mother is you who is your mother your mother is you so it's one thing to um, remember that and it is a boat to the other shore that's just another factor that can bring you to the other shore So 
hear a sound of the bell. And we can take three deep breaths just to absorb Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. So let's get ready for our final sit together. Oh, Charlie commented. So I have given, given a present and it worked. Oh, for sharing. I can't wait to do it though. I can't, I then to do it then. It's probably then, right? <laughs> Hey, if Ty says that it works, I'm willing to try. And if you say it works, I'm willing to try. So this will just be a silent sit and we'll sit for five minutes. So I'd like to invite you to get into a comfortable position um, with spine erect and upright and somewhere be between wakefulness and allowing your body to rest, um, not slouching, but just feeling rested and maybe not making sure, making sure that your neck is not tilted forward, that it might be just balanced there in the middle. And we'll listen to three sounds of the bell. And we'll sit in silence and the end of the bell.
small bell for stretching and massage. All right, so let's close with a song. We're gonna sing a song. I think, I'm not sure if everybody knows a lot of these. Their songs that are popular in village tradition, which is Thich Nhat Hanh's order. Um, I wish I had where it could cut and paste it in the chat, but I don't have them handy. I'm trying to see if I have a song everybody knows. Um, I guess we'll just sing Breathing In, Breathing Out, because that one's a very popular one. And this one was also um, converted into a wake up song, which wake up is a sangha that is for children and uh, young adults, and they added hand movements to this song. So uh, let's water the seeds of joy and some songs. So I'll sing it a couple times, maybe three times, and you can join in whenever. If you know the song, you can join in, and it's cool and it's repetitive, so um, you, know, you can jump in as as you can. Okay. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. I am blooming hour. I am fresh as the dew. I am solid as a mountain. I am firm as the earth. I breathe, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. I am water reflecting what is real, what is true, and I feel there deep inside of me. I am free, I am free, I am free. Let's sing it again. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. I am blooming as a I am fresh as the dew. I am solid as a sorry, solid as a mountain. I'm firm as the earth. I am free, breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. I am water reflecting what is real, what is true. And I feel that there is space deep inside of me. I am free, I am free, I am free. Should we do it one more time? I think we have a few more minutes because Lindsay's gonna pop on at seven o'clock to do story time. So let's do it one more time. Okay. Ready? Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. I am blooming as a flower. I am fresh as the dew. I am solid as a mountain. I am firm as the earth. I am free.
free, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. I am water reflecting what is real, what is true, and I feel there is space deep inside of me. I am free, I am free, I am free. Yay, Plum Village applause. <laughs> well, I really want to thank you for your practice today. Um, thank you for showing up for yourself and for showing up for your practice. Um, this practice is such a valuable one that Thich Nhat Hanh gave us. This practice of engaged Buddhism, where it takes the Buddhism and Buddhist practices out of the monastery and into the world and into our lives so that we can have ways to transform our anger and transform our anxiety, tra transform our, our sorrow and that we can make space for ourselves and expand our capacity to be the lights in the world that we need to be. So thank you so much for your practice. A bow and a smile to you. Hope you have a great rest of your night. May 21, June 4, and June 18th are our next dates that, that have been approved by the Friends of the Library. So please save the dates, 6 p.m. right here on the Uxbridge Library Facebook page. Bye. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Charlie. Bye-bye. <laughs>